We talk a lot about pregnancy skincare, but no one really talks about how to take care of your skin after you give birth. The cracked nipples, care down there, taking care of stitches and stretch marks. So today we are addressing postpartum skincare. to the channel, welcome. I'm Dr. Sam Ellis and I'm a board certified medical and cosmetic dermatologist in Northern California. I started this whole channel to help you understand your skin and find products that work for you. So if that sounds good, give this video a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Before we get into this video, I wanna make it very clear, this is not personal medical advice. This is advice I would give to a healthy postpartum person, but if you have specific questions about your skin in the postpartum period, it's really important to consult with your own healthcare team. Because we're going to be talking about ingredients and products in this video, I also wanna make it very clear that it is unethical to test ingredients or products on pregnant or breastfeeding people. A lot of what we do when we're determining product safety and whether something can be used during lactation or during pregnancy is to actually look backwards. We look at people who use these products while breastfeeding or during pregnancy and then see what outcomes the babies had. But of course, this method is flawed because there are so many different factors that go into raising a healthy child. So we always have to take this information with a grain of salt and use our best medical judgment before we decide what to use. Ultimately, I don't want anyone using anything that they or their healthcare provider is not comfortable with them using. So again, always consult with your own healthcare team, but this is my perspective and everything I'm mentioning in this video is what I felt comfortable doing during my own pregnancy and breastfeeding journey. So during pregnancy and in the postpartum period, there are some common changes that people will notice. And I actually have an entire video about skincare changes during pregnancy, so you should also check that out if you have questions. But in general, some changes that you will see, and a lot of this is attributable to the hormone changes that you have during pregnancy, are things like irregular pigmentation, so whether that's melasma on the face or darkening of the armpits and groin, or even developing something called a linea nigra, which is a dark pigmented band on the abdomen. A lot of people will also experience new blood vessel growth during pregnancy, so they might notice new telangiectasia or dilated blood vessels on their face or on their body. That usually comes on during pregnancy, but then people may want to address it in the postpartum period if it doesn't fade on its own. Another thing people may notice during pregnancy and postpartum is acne. Again, this is due to those fluctuating hormones, and oftentimes postpartum, people will go on a progesterone-only birth control because it doesn't interfere with lactation, so whether that's an IUD or a progesterone pill, and that can drive acne in a lot of people. And another thing almost every postpartum person will experience is hair shedding. This is called telogen effluvium, and it tends to happen about three to four months after birth. If you have questions about that, I have an entire YouTube video dedicated to telogen effluvium. So when you experience all of these skin changes during and after pregnancy, one of the biggest questions I get is, okay, well, what skincare can I actually use to treat them? What's considered safe or okay to use while I'm breastfeeding? One thing I wanna mention here is that most skincare is completely safe while breastfeeding. Oftentimes you're only applying it to a small surface area of your skin, and I always I always try to remind people your skin is not a sponge. Not everything you apply to your skin gets into your bloodstream. And even things that are detected in the bloodstream are detected at small amounts and they have not been shown to cause problems or human harm. What I do think is important is that you're not applying a lot of these products directly to the nipple if you're breastfeeding. And then of course, if you're using anything that's potentially irritating, whether that's some type of exfoliating acid or retinoid, which we are going to talk about, you just wanna make sure that those aren't coming in direct contact with baby's skin right after you apply them. But say you put on a retinoid and then an hour later you wanna breastfeed them, that's completely fine. So speaking of retinoids, let's just get right into it because it's probably the biggest misconception out there in my opinion as a dermatologist when it comes to breastfeeding safe skincare and retinoids are okay to use during breastfeeding. That would be the advice I would give to my own patients about this. And I started using a retinoid the day I took my baby home from the hospital. The reason there's so much debate around this is retinoids are a vitamin A derived compound and oral retinoids, which we give for people who have acne and other skin disorders have been shown to cause birth defects in fetuses. So we definitely don't give oral retinoids during pregnancy. We also don't give topical retinoids to use during pregnancy. And that is just out of an abundance of caution, even though topical retinoids applied to the skin in small surface areas are not even detected in the bloodstream, we are just being extra careful because we don't wanna mess around with fetal complications. But after you deliver the baby in the postpartum period, the risk of a birth defect is no longer there. So in my opinion, there is no reason why you can't use topical vitamin A at that point. 
Of course, if you have questions about this or you have concerns, absolutely discuss it with your healthcare provider. So this goes for prescription retinoids that I use to treat acne as well as over-the-counter retinoids. So things like retinol, retinaldehyde, adapalene, and tretinoin. Another ingredient I often get asked about is hydroquinone. Hydroquinone is the gold standard treatment for hyperpigmentation. It inhibits an enzyme called tyrosinase, which essentially makes pigment in your skin. So when you stop that process, you can stop that hyperpigmentation as well. Now, although hydroquinone has not been shown to cause health effects when absorbed absorbed systemically, one thing we do know about hydroquinone is it can be absorbed through the skin. So even if you're applying small amounts, that does make it into the bloodstream and can ultimately make it into breast milk. And so for that reason, because it can be transferred to breast milk, we just recommend staying away from it during breastfeeding. However, I will say I've been to conferences with some of the leaders in pigmented skin disorders around the world, and they have said that in certain cases, they will give their patients who struggle with hyperpigmentation hydroquinone while breastfeeding. Melasma is certainly something that I have struggled with postpartum, but I have just chosen to not do hydroquinone during this time. I know it's sort of a fleeting period, and as soon as I stop breastfeeding, I'm getting on it. But since I haven't been using hydroquinone, I've been using other products that help with hyperpigmentation. So things like tretinoin, as well as alpha hydroxy acids, which just increase cell turnover and help slough off some of that hyperpigmented skin. I also use ingredients like licorice root extract and kojic acid and vitamin C. And again, this is all sort of theoretical. So what I feel comfortable with might be different from what someone else feels comfortable with. And it's all about doing what works for you and kind of setting your goals and priorities with your skin and your baby. So I will often prescribe topical retinol to be used for postpartum acne. The other thing I will often prescribe is spironolactone. Although it exists as a topical medication, I typically prescribe oral spironolactone for the treatment of hormonal acne, which is often the type of acne we see in a postpartum individual. This medication has been deemed safe by the World Health Organization to be used during lactation. There is this myth out there that it decreases milk supply in a breastfeeding mom, but that has never been proven to be true. So for example, I take spironolactone every single day, and I've been doing it since I was about eight months postpartum. That's when I started to see the hormonal acne really come in and it was really bothering me. And so spironolactone felt like a good option for me. That and tretinoin are really my go-tos. And then another topical product that I often get asked about for use in the postpartum period is minoxidil for hair growth. Sometimes people were using minoxidil before they got pregnant to help with hair growth and they wanna know if they're okay to restart it. And some people just want to start minoxidil in the postpartum period because they know they're going to have that hair shedding and they wanna optimize that as much as possible. Minoxidil is considered safe in breastfeeding, we estimate that about one to 2% is absorbed systemically. The reason I personally have chosen to not use minoxidil while breastfeeding is because some people, including patients I've had, develop things like heart palpitations or have systemic side effects while using topical minoxidil. And the fact that that could happen to me or could happen to my baby while I was breastfeeding made me not feel comfortable using it. But that's just me. And for sure, we do not recommend the use of minoxidil during pregnancy. Your hair is going to be long and luscious and amazing during pregnancy anyway, so just take that as a break. So those are just sort of like the skincare basics. Now let's get into like the specific problems that people experience postpartum and what to do about them. Let's start with stretch marks. This is something most people will experience during pregnancy and you don't have to do anything about stretch marks. They are totally normal, but I get tons of questions about ways to best address stretch marks. So we should talk about it. So the most tried and true topical for reducing the appearance of stretch marks is tretinoin. In the United States, this is a prescription retinoid. So you wanna talk with your healthcare provider about getting a prescription if you want it. We use retinoids or topical vitamin A derivatives to induce new collagen formation in the skin. And essentially when you have a stretch mark, you have a scar in the dermis. It's a stretch or fracture of the dermal tissue and you need repair in that area. So anything that's going to induce new collagen formation can help repair that scar. I typically recommend 0.1% tretinoin, which is stronger than what a lot of people use on their face for things like acne or anti-aging. But on the body where the skin is less sensitive, that's the potency that's used in the trials and that's what I would use. The way you would want to apply this is to use about a pea-sized amount for about a face-sized amount of area on your skin. So if you have stretch marks on both sides of your abdomen, you probably want to use about a fingertips length on each side. In a perfect world, you would apply this once a day, but of course, if you're having too much irritation, just use it as many days as possible. Now, if you don't have access to tretinoin or it's too irritating for your skin, what you could get over the counter is 0.1% adapalene gel, which is another retinoid. Adapalene is not sold generically in the US, so you would look for the brand name Differin or Effaclar by La Roche-Posay. And then lastly, if you wanted something that's a bit more streamlined and simplified, you could use a topical retinol body lotion. Now I should say retinol has not been shown to improve stretch marks the same way tretinoin 
one has, but that's just because it has not been studied in that capacity. And when we look at how retinol affects things like premature skin aging, we do see that it has really good pro-collagen effects and skin repairing effects. So I think it makes sense to include that in this category. The reason I like a retinol body lotion is if you're gonna be moisturizing your skin anyway, which can be nice to do to take care of yourself in the postpartum period, having the retinol step already incorporated in can make things faster and more efficient. I know I've spoken about this before. I really love the Naturium Retinol Body Lotion. I think this is such a great, lightweight, easy to spread lotion. And in addition to applying this on your stretch marks, you can also apply it on the rest of your body, like your arms and your legs. Because remember, topical retinoids, especially something low potency like retinol, I would consider safe in breastfeeding. Just don't put it on your nipples. There are also in-office treatments like microneedling and lasers that you can do for stretch marks. And if you want more information on that, I have a specific YouTube video about stretch mark treatments that goes much more in depth. Now let's talk about sort of birth-related healing, whether you have a vaginal delivery or a C-section. One thing that's good to know, regardless of the type of birth you have, is that a lot of hospitals will give you supplies to take home with you. So just ask, hey, do you have some postpartum supplies that I can take with me to take care of my skin afterward? And they're usually happy to give them to you. And I'll tell you what to ask for. One tip that I have is in the hospital bag that you're bringing for your delivery, take a little reusable fold up grocery bag because when you get your supplies, it's nice to have a separate bag that you can kind of whip out and take your products home with you. I did not do this and I basically had like armfuls of products going home and it was honestly embarrassing. All right, let's start with taking care of your skin after a vaginal birth. What do you do down there? Now, as a dermatologist, I'm not going to call it down there. Let's use the medical term. So there's the perineum, which is the area of skin between the opening of your vagina and your anus. That's the area that's most likely to tear during a vaginal delivery. And then you have your anus and that's where your poop comes out and that's where hemorrhoids can form. And those are kind of the two main things we're going to talk about, perineal tears and hemorrhoids. Let's start with stitches. If you have a tear of the perineum during delivery, which is very common, they are going to place stitches in the perineum to help repair that tissue. Those stitches will generally dissolve over the course of seven to 14 days, so you don't usually have to go back to your doctor to have them removed. But while they're in there, you do wanna be taking care of them because they can be a little bit irritating and sensitive. So the number one thing I'm going to recommend to take care of your stitches is just cleaning that area regularly. And one of the best things to do that is something called a peri bottle, which is short for perineum bottle. So in the hospital, they will generally give you a peri bottle to help clean yourself. It just looks like a little squirt water bottle. The issue I have with that is that it's very hard to aim that at your perineum unless you have like flexibility and you're not in pain and I don't know, it wasn't my favorite. So there is one by Frida where it has a little U at the end. So it's much easier to just sort of get the squirt where you need it to go. I kind of wish I had bought one of those before I went to the hospital and had brought it with me. And again, I was able to use the peri bottle that they provided, but it was just a little bit less than ideal. The main reason you want to use a peri bottle is because wiping with toilet paper is not going to feel amazing right after you give birth. So using water to cleanse like a little bidet is essentially what you want to do. And if you have an at-home bidet that's really gentle, that's another option. Now, one tip I have aside from using the peri bottle to just clean that area every time you go to the restroom is also to squirt that water on the perineum while you are urinating. Urine can cause a lot of stinging and burning initially, especially if you have a tear or stitches that are healing. And when you squirt the water at the same time, it's really soothing. Now, when you get to the point postpartum where you feel comfortable taking a shower, that might be the day you give birth. It might take a few days before you're up for taking a shower and whatever works for you is totally fine. But at that point, you're going to wanna to use a little bit of gentle soapy water to clean that area. And I really recommend for this just using a gentle facial cleanser. So the La Roche-Posay Hydrating Cleanser is one of my favorites. It's super delicate, it doesn't sting, and it's just a great way to sort of clean that area postpartum. You can even put a little squirt of that into your peri bottle and then fill it up in the shower and apply it that way. Now, of course, you can apply the cleanser with your hands like you normally would, but I just felt like postpartum, I didn't want to touch that area. It felt sensitive and I just didn't want to mess anything up. So using the peri bottle for like, I think probably I used it for about a week afterward was great. Some people might wonder if they can just get away with using water as a cleanser postpartum for the first week or two. And in most cases that is going to be fine, but because you're going to be having postpartum bleeding and discharge, something called lochia, that can kind of build up and it's a breeding ground for bacteria. So you just want to make sure that you're able to fully rinse that away. And if you're able to do that with water, that's fine. But sometimes adding soap to help kind of cleanse that area and remove some of that debris is also helpful. Now, the last thing you want to do with stitches, and I find this really helpful, is to keep them moist with Vaseline. The perineum is going to heal regardless. There is a very rich blood supply there. It heals amazingly well, but the value of Vaseline is that it keeps your stitches kind of supple. The stitches they use can feel kind of pokey, almost like 
fishing line. So if you keep them soft with Vaseline, they're less likely to poke and irritate you. And you can just apply this a couple times a day to the area after you go to the restroom and clean with a peri bottle. Aside from dealing with perineal tears in the postpartum period, a lot of women who undergo vaginal births, and even those who don't, may also experience hemorrhoids. And hemorrhoids are essentially just a swollen vein around the anus or the rectum. And this happens to prolonged increased pressure in that area, which can happen during pregnancy just from being constipated or carrying a large weight in your abdomen, but also from that prolonged pushing during labor. And sometimes hemorrhoids are not bothersome at all, and they often get better in the postpartum period, even if you do nothing. But for some people, they are tender or itchy, so let's talk about what to do. So things you can do for hemorrhoids. The first thing you can do is sit on a donut pillow. These donut pillows essentially distribute pressure in the nether regions a little more evenly so that you're not putting additional pressure around the anus and rectum. In addition to that, you kind of just wanna spend as little time as possible sitting on a toilet. When you sit on a toilet, that puts additional pressure in that area. And that is known to cause hemorrhoids in pregnant people, postpartum people, and literally anyone. Another thing you can use are witch hazel pads. Those are meant to be very soothing on hemorrhoids. So those are just lined in the underwear and can help with hemorrhoid discomfort. Probably the most popular brand is something called Tux and I've had a lot of my friends swear by them. Another thing you can do at home for really uncomfortable or itchy hemorrhoids is to use Preparation H. This usually has an anti-inflammatory in it as well as something to help with itching as well as constriction of those swollen blood vessels. And then of course, if you're having significant pain or bleeding from your hemorrhoids is to consult with your physician. Now, whether you're dealing with stitches or hemorrhoids, there is some skincare that you can use for both of them. So one thing that can be helpful if you're having a lot of itch or pain is a topical numbing cream, like a numbing spray like Dermaplast. Now, there's some data that says that these aren't particularly helpful when you compare it to just ice, but if you really feel like you need that additional relief, that's totally fine to use. I think probably the best thing you can do for your perineal health and just your discomfort overall postpartum is to ice regularly for the first 48 to 72 hours postpartum. So while you're in the hospital after delivery, they're going to put an ice pack pad combo in your very sexy mesh underwear. And so it's essentially a pad, but it also has an ice pack that you sort of break in there. And essentially you just change that out every couple of hours when the ice stops working. I don't know if this is TMI, but I was basically icing around the clock for the first 48 hours because it was so relieving. And also that area is really swollen afterward and you kind of want to reduce that and ice is very helpful for this. I definitely recommend asking the hospital for some ice pack pad combos. I don't know what the proper name for those are, but I definitely took some home and then when I was home, I ended up buying some off of Amazon as well. The ones I got were the Dr. Jeff's perineal ice packs, but I think any of them would work. You'll also need some type of adult diaper or pad postpartum. I think a lot of people don't realize that even if you have a C-section birth, you're still going to have bleeding postpartum. So no matter what type of birth you have, having some pads or adult diapers at home is helpful. I sort of have a preference for the pads. I think they're easier to use because then you can just combine that with mesh underwear and you don't just have a trash bag full of big diapers. You'll already be dealing with enough tiny diapers. I didn't really wanna to add to that. So with postpartum pads, you essentially just wanna change them as soon as they become saturated. Again, this moist, warm environment is just a breeding ground for bacteria. So in addition to cleansing that area regularly, changing your pad regularly as well is really important. Sometimes the hospital will give you mesh undies to take home. My hospital was being very singy and they didn't send me home with a single pair. So I bought a pack of the Frida mesh undies and they were wonderful. And then I sent my husband out to the drugstore to get a massive, massive thing of of maxi pads. And I really like the stay free overnight maxi pads. Anything that's labeled overnight is going to be a lot more absorptive. And of course you're gonna wear them at night, but you're also going to be using these during the day as well. And then the last sort of thing that I think really helps for postpartum skincare, and this is gonna sound weird because you're gonna be like, this isn't skin at all, is taking a stool softener. But I'll tell you why. When you have given birth, no matter how you have given birth, Trying to have a bowel movement after that is very sensitive and you will feel this. You do not wanna put any additional pressure in that area. So if your stools are soft and you don't have to force them out of your body, your skin will thank you. If someone has been constipated throughout their pregnancy, I definitely recommend them discussing taking a stool softener even before they give birth with their OB-GYN. 
But for most people, after you give birth as part of your postpartum medication, they will be giving you a stool softener already, but it's nice to have some to take home as well. And that's usually one of your discharge medications. So they will give you medications to pick up at the pharmacy when you leave the hospital. And usually one of those is a stool softener because they know. All right, now let's move on to how to take care of your skin after you have a C-section. Now, of course, you're always going to want to defer to the surgeon who performed your C-section. They're the ones that are familiar with your specific case and are going to give you very specific instructions. But if you're at home and you're like, eh, I didn't really get that great of instructions and they're not getting back to me or I don't feel comfortable reaching out to them, this is sort of like basic wound care for your C-section. The other thing I should mention is that C-sections are done differently depending on your body type, who performs your surgery. Sometimes they are closed with stitches and sometimes they are closed with staples. Now your surgeon will definitely talk to you about how they want you to care for your stitches or your staples, but this is what I would recommend from like a derm perspective, especially a cosmetic derm perspective in terms of taking care of that incision site afterward to minimize any scar appearance. So as soon as your stitches or staples come out, granted everything's healing well, you don't have any evidence of infection, is to start using silicone gel sheets. You can get these on Amazon. You essentially just cut them to size and you put a strip right across your C-section scar. These sheets are meant to last for a couple days at a time. So you really don't have to change them out that regularly. As soon as you see them sort of like lifting up on the sides, that's a good sign to just start a new one. Another thing that's really important to do is minimize tension or pulling on the scar. Even after surgery, once that skin is quote unquote repaired, it's only about 30% as strong as normal skin. So if you can avoid things like bending backwards or twisting in ways that's putting tension on the scar, you're going to heal better. And then ultimately, sometimes in office procedures are needed to improve the appearance of scars. So very commonly, and basically in all of my medical assistants, PAs, nurses, anyone in my office who has a baby, they come in pretty much as soon as they give birth to get their scars treated. The sooner you address your scars with things like lasers or microneedling, the better they're going to heal. Now, I understand this is not practical for a lot of people postpartum, and it is a luxury to be able to have in-office treatments for your scars, but it's just something I mentioned because a lot of people want to know how do you get the most optimal postpartum or any post-surgical scar, and lasers as soon as possible is one way to do that. Let's move on to nipples. Breastfeeding nipple care is so important. Now, you will hear most breastfeeding people complain about dry, cracked, painful nipples. And although this is something that a lot of people experience, it is not normal. If you are having nipple pain, chafing, cracking, bleeding, that usually means there's a problem with how the baby is latching when they're breastfeeding. They might have a shallow latch. They might have an oral tie, like a tongue tie that's preventing it. So the number one thing to do if your nipples are in pain or in discomfort is to have a lactation consultation to make sure you're optimizing your baby's feeding. But until then, because sometimes it takes a little while for mom and baby to sort of get the hang of things, this is what you can do to help with your nipples. And one thing I should mention is having access to a lactation consultant is usually covered in your insurance. So don't just skip it, like get the help that you need. It's not a very intuitive thing for a lot of people and having some coaching and sort of a third person giving you advice is really, really helpful. We'll start with like cracked, painful nipples because I feel like this is probably the most common thing that people experience. So one thing you can use is something called hydrogel pads. So these are a small pad that are placed over the nipple and areola when you're not breastfeeding. And it essentially serves as a barrier between that and your shirt. Because if your nipples are sensitized from breastfeeding or they are cracked, they're going to be extra prone to irritation with any type of friction. So that acts as a shield or a protective barrier. Now there are definitely a lot of different brands of hydrogel patches. Probably one of the more common ones is by a brand called Lansano. Now the thing with that is you wanna look on the package to see how long they want you to use or reuse these pads. Some they want you to toss every 24 hours, some will last you a few days. And then one thing that's really important to note because I'm about to talk about like nipple creams and ointments is you usually don't wanna be using an ointment and a hydrogel patch at the exact same time. You're using one or the other and you can alternate, but you don't wanna put on a nipple cream and then try to apply a hydrogel patch. Basically, it's going to prevent the hydrogel patch from sticking ideally. And if you have a medicated cream as part of your nipple care, you don't wanna occlude that or put direct pressure around it. And then another little tip is to keep your hydrogel patches in the fridge because that additional cooling sensation on the nipple can help with swelling and irritation. I didn't use any hydrogel patches sort of in my postpartum care, but I think they're a really nice option for people who don't feel comfortable using nipple creams or they don't wanna use nipple creams. This is another way to care for them. But I will say there is nothing wrong with nipple creams and they can be 
very helpful for people. But the first thing and probably the most recommended type of nipple cream is just pure lanolin. And when you're in the hospital postpartum, usually a lactation consultant will see you before you leave and they'll give you a bag of little lanolin packets typically to take home, but you can get them also online. If you have a sensitivity to lanolin, because some people are sensitive or allergic to it, there are certainly lanolin free nipple creams that work very well too. Probably one of the most common ones is the bodily nip protect. This has things like shea butter and olive oil and coconut oil. But I think what's important to mention about both lanolin and lanolin free nipple creams is they are safe for baby to consume in small amounts. So you don't have to wipe them off before you feed the baby. And actually that additional friction of trying to clean off the nipples before you feed your infant can cause additional trauma. Now, if your nipples are really painful or you're developing a rash because you can get bacterial and yeast infections of the nipple area, it might be worth talking to your OBGYN about getting a prescription for something called all purpose nipple ointment. So this is a prescription compounded ointment that has an antibacterial, antifungal, and anti-inflammatory in it. And it can really help soothe people if they're struggling. And then the last thing I'll mention about nipple care is using a true nipple barrier. So one thing you can get are something called breast shells. They essentially, again, act as sort of a barrier between your nipples and your shirt. A lot of times they will also collect additional milk. So one thing I didn't realize before I had a baby is that even when you're not breastfeeding, you can be leaking milk. So having something tucked into your bra that's not only protecting your nipples, but also collecting that precious milk is really nice. So for example, LV, which makes a lot of other like breast pumps and things like that, also makes these great little breast shells. Another thing that you might wanna use is something called a nipple shield. I feel like before introducing a nipple shield, which is essentially a little barrier that's kept on the nipple while the baby is breastfeeding, it's really important to talk to your OBGYN because again, if you're needing a breast shield, which can be very helpful for people, especially if you have something like inverted nipples, it's important to get proper coaching on how to use those correctly so that they work the best for you. And then another barrier that I personally swear by, and I've had many friends have success with these are something called silverettes. Silverettes are essentially little nipple covers that you keep on in between breastfeeding. And silver has antimicrobial and healing properties to it. And actually that is all I personally used during my breastfeeding journey. I probably wore silverettes for the first four months of breastfeeding. And then I felt like I really had the hang of it. I had zero sensitivity and that's what I continued thereafter. Now it's not to say I wouldn't have used nipple creams or other barriers if needed, but for me, silverettes were more than enough. I never really struggled with this and I feel very fortunate for that. I brought these in my hospital bag and I started using them from day one of breastfeeding. Now these do come in a couple of different sizes and you wanna get the size that's right for your nipple. So before you deliver, just check out and make sure you get the right size silverette. But I think these are just amazing. I have them saved if I ever decide to have another baby. And if not, you can actually send it in and turn it into a little charm as a keepsake if you want to. And then similar to the hydrogels, if you're using a silverette, you really don't need to apply any other nipple creams. You essentially put a teeny drop of breast milk into the basin of the silverette apply that and then put your bra on. Whether you're thinking about getting pregnant, you're currently pregnant, or you are experiencing the postpartum period, I hope this video was really helpful for you. Now, if you've already had a baby, do you have any postpartum tips to add? I'm sure people would love to read those, so put them in the comments. As always, thank you so, so much for watching. Don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel.